Hey everyone, welcome to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. Today I want to talk about an interview that I gave recently with a Protestant apologist. Well, I had assumed that she was Protestant from the previous work that I had seen from her, but she actually had left the Catholic faith, embraced Protestantism, was going out defending mere Christianity, the Bible, Christ's resurrection. But after engaging with me and with some of my work in my book, Case for Catholicism, this Protestant apologist, S.J. Thomason, now desires to return to the Catholic faith. So please pray for her in her continuing spiritual journey. But we had a really great conversation. I want to play a few clips where she talks about her experiences of leaving Catholicism, and now her desire to return to it, as well as some of the questions that I answered on her live stream. And this is great to see, because I i mean, I really enjoy working with Protestants who have a passion for defending mere Christianity, who have a passion for defending Christ's resurrection, the reliability of Scripture. I love being able to stand shoulder to shoulder with them, although those times are also great opportunities to share why I'm Catholic with them, and we can have great spirited conversations you know, when that happens. I also really love seeing female apologists. There's not a lot of female apologists, and we should have more of them. I'd love to see more women being represented, going out, and especially engaging others in these arguments. There are some out there. I've promoted them before. You should definitely go and check them out. But being able to meet someone like SJ, it was wonderful to be able to speak with her. And like I said, please pray for her in her continuing spiritual journey, discernment, and her return to the Catholic faith from Protestantism. And pray for a lot of fruit coming from her other apologetics work that's especially focused on mere Christianity. But with that being said, here are some of my clips with my chat with SJ Thomason about how a Protestant apologist now seeks to return to the Catholic faith. Here's how I how I came into contact with Trent. So I went on to Twitter and I was in my quest to try to find the truth. I decided I really need to know about Mother Mary. And because I feel like I had an experience with Mother Mary when I was in college and I want and I've never lost touch with that and I've always revered her, but I felt like I had left the Catholic faith, gone over to the Baptist faith, and it seemed like a lot of people in these Protestant faiths kind of put down Mother Mary and they want to bring her down to just a, a just a lower level than she she should be. I think she's the mother of God and I think she's also the queen of heaven. And Revelation 12 told me that. And so I had this question on Twitter and I I said something like, I want to know about Mother Mary's perpetual virginity because I'd read Jerome and I read Helvidius and at the time, I didn't have a reason in my mind that I should pick Jerome over Helvidius. And mm. so I thought, maybe I'll post that question. And I think I tagged you. And then you offered to send me your book, which you did so generously. Yes. And so as I read the book, I just felt like the blinders, like Paul. <laughs> when I was trying to figure out about Helvidius and Jerome, one of the things that I hadn't done, and this is one of the reasons why I think the Catholic Church has a lot going for it, is it's tradition, it's history, and it's saints, and especially the 37 church doctors' saints. And yes. so I, I thought to myself, I, I thought, first I thought of my own con confirmation when I picked, I picked wisdom. <laughs> that was what, that was what I wanted. <laughs> yeah. And I picked St. Catherine of Siena. And I don't really recall exactly, well, I know I, why I picked her name because it was the name of my mother's other sister. And I'm named after my mother's one sister, but I, I also picked her. And I, so I decided maybe I'll go read what Catherine of Siena says. Maybe there's something that I need to know. Well, that turns out she's a church doctor, which I didn't know. And I read her, I read her dialogue with God and, and then God pointed to Jerome, actually named Jerome. So then I thought, huh, mm -hmm. God's actually giving these people some sort of a, a credibility. And right. so I went back and then read Jerome and I thought, why am I picking on the, the one who Jerome called a heretic? <laughs> right. So, so then I thought, wait a second, what am I doing here? Maybe I need to reverse my thinking. And so does that seem kind of reasonable? <laughs> Right. No, I, I think that that makes that makes perfect sense. Uh, I, I also wanted to clarify something that you said earlier. So you were baptized Catholic, but you left after college and now you're experiencing a reversion. Yeah. So I was baptized Catholic. OK. And when I was in my 20s, well, I had this experience with Mother Mary, I believe, right. when I was in college and that was in my senior year. And I was just in a major panic. And I remember she appeared to me and she just comforted me and she oh, wow. said, everything's going to be OK. 
And, and I, the next day I just felt really clean, like just, just so wow. amazingly pure. And I was so happy. And then, so I never would forget her. I always had her in my mind, but then in my twenties, I started kind of waffling around and parting too much and doing all this stuff. And sure. so I just sort of went away from the church. And then I, then I, we came, we ended up over here on this coast of Florida. I'm on the West coast of Florida. Now I was on the East coast then, and I got a job in 2007 over here. And so my son started asking me when he was little, why aren't we going to church? So we thought, well, let's just test out all these churches. Yeah, and yeah. we walked into this Baptist church and I loved it. And so that was about 10 years ago. And then I started saying, well, wait a second, we're kind of miss all these people were coming up to me especially atheists. They said, Christians have 40,000 different denominations. You guys have to get your act together. And I thought, huh, we need a central authority. And who has a central authority? Right. Ah, the Catholics do. And so that gets us to the next question of, do yeah. you think that Peter was the first pope? Do you think we have enough compelling evidence saying that there's a papal succession from Peter? Sure. And I think once again, for Protestants who wrestle with this question, it's important to apply similar standards, all right? So if you're willing, like, why do you believe, for example, that all Christian doctrine is found in Scripture uh, and is only, you know, only found in Scripture, that it's, quote unquote, the only infallible rule of faith, what we call sola scriptura? What evidence do you have for the doctrine of sola scriptura? And a lot of Protestants will say 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, but even then they'll admit that it's not, explicit necessarily in scripture but so they're willing to believe in that authority structure of this particular 66 book canon of scripture as being the sole and infallible rule of faith based on evidence that's not particularly strong and so i'd say well if that evidence moves you what if there was a, a bible verse where jesus said upon these writings i shall build the foundation of my church upon the rock of these writings uh, these scriptures, I shall build my church, and anyone who believes in them and only what is in them will have, you know, if he said that about scripture, I think Protestants would say, well, there, there you go, sola scriptura. But he doesn't. He says that about Peter, actually. And not just about Peter, but Jesus invests the apostles with authority. Like, I would ask, all right, uh, before we get to the Pope, I think a lot of Protestants can't really wrap their head around the Pope until they have an idea of apostolic succession. And to get to there, I have to say, look, what did Jesus leave us? Did he leave us a Bible or did he leave us a living teaching authority? And when you look in the Gospels, uh, you know, from Jesus's earthly ministry to his ascension, Jesus never tells anyone to write anything down. He, he never tells anybody to write anything down, uh, which is odd if Scripture was our sole authority. Uh, then later you get Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament letters there is no teaching about that, uh, that a collection of writings will be the church's authority. Rather, it's vested in the apostles. They have the authority. What they bind in heaven, what they bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What? You're telling me the apostles, these men, can bind what is going to be the case in heaven? And of course, that teaching references what rabbis did when they te gave authoritative teachings. And Peter is given this in particular, not just all the apostles, but Peter is the leader of the apostles. He's given this special authority in Matthew 16 and John 21. He is Simon's name is changed to Peter. You are rock, and on this rock I'll build my church. I know there's a giant debate, like, is Peter the rock? You know, all this other kind of stuff. And my fallback question to that is to say, look, why did Jesus change Simon's name in the first place? Why did he change it? When God changes somebody's name in Scripture, it's because they have a new identity and a new mission. So I would just say, so Jesus, Jesus changes Simon's name, but he's really the rock. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. So I think it's clear when we look at the apostles have authority in the church, we see in the New Testament, they lay hands on others. Nobody in the New Testament ever becomes a pastor of their own decision. You can't just hang up a sign and say, I started a church. You have hands laid on you by other people who go back to the apostles. And then when we read in the early church, since we're not soul scripture advocates, I don't think that's biblical. We look at first the writings of First Clement. We look at saying nations of Antioch. They are saying nations of Antioch is very clear. He says if you don't have a bishop, if your church lacks bishops, priests, and deacons, it's not a real church. He says do nothing without the bishop, just as Jesus does nothing without the Father. So we've got this framework in the early church. Seems very clear that is built on apostolic succession. And then we just have to ask from Scripture and history: Are one of the apostles and his successors have a certain authority over others? 
which makes sense that 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 person exists to provide unity in the church, just like how in ancient Israel, God was the king of Israel. You or you sorry, you had the king of Israel, and you had his vizier, the the prime minister who oversaw the kingdom, like in Isaiah twenty two twenty two about the keys of the kingdom being given to Eliakim and Shebna, the wicked Shebna given to Eliakim. And when it says, whatever he opens, others shall not shut. What he shuts, no one shall open. That same language is found in Matthew 16, 18. So it seems that Jesus is the, he is the Lord, the king of, of the church, the king of the kingdom of God. But Peter acts there as the, the prime minister overseeing everything. Uh, so I think when you put all that together, you've got good evidence for an apostolic succession and a particular in office of the papacy. If we were to pick a saint or a church father or somebody else who's in ancient times or relatively recent, who would be a good one for somebody to read? If, Like, for example, I said I wanted to go read the 37 church fathers. And yes, boy, is that a, that's going to be a, a bear of a amount of work because I, yeah. I looked at St. Thomas Aquinas's book, Summa Theologica, and it's ridiculously <laughs> yes. huge. Yes, so, we, yes. <laughs> so what would you recommend somebody like me or anybody else? What, would, what should we go look at or which are some people you'd recommend reading their books? Well, one, if you want to read a church father, uh, and first, I would definitely uh, recommend uh, one of the early apostolic fathers. There, Rod Bennett is a Catholic author who has a book called The Four Witnesses, and I believe that refers to Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, the Shepherd, and maybe Justin Martyr, writers within the first 100 years of Christian history. So Rod Bennett has a great book called The Four Witnesses. But if I had to zero in on one, I would pick St. Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have a video about this on my channel called The, the Church Father Protestants Fear the Most, uh, because he's very early, writing around the year 106, 110, so less than 100 years after the crucifixion, very early. And yet he doesn't sound like you would think of a primitive Protestant Christian. He's very keen on the authority of the bishop on the need for a hierarchical church. He talks about the Eucharist in very uh, terms that would relate to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Uh, so what he talks about there, I would say, would seem foreign to a lot of Protestant understandings of church authority, so much so that throughout history, some Protestants, so some of his letters are later and are forged, but others tried to argue all of his letters were forged uh, because of how, how Catholic they sound. So if you wanted to pick one, I would go with saying Nations of Antioch, to start. It's a, a quick read and def definitely, definitely a great beginning. And then maybe pick up Rod Bennett's book, The Four Witnesses. Hmm. I actually, I'd listened to your video where you mentioned St. Ignatius. So I, I went and I listened to a whole bunch of his sort of epistles, his, yes. his letters to these churches. So I, I, I would agree. I think they sound kind of like what Paul writes. Yes. But they also have that very Catholic element to them, especially about, and in fact, St. Ignatius of Antioch was the one who coined the term Catholic Church, the Ecclesia Cata Holos, the Church according to the whole, or the Catholic Church. Hmm, that's very good. That's very good. So, and what do you think if if you had to pick of the people in the last century? If we look at like G.K. Chesterton, or we look at C.S. Lewis, I know C.S. Lewis is a, not a Catholic, sure, but, sure. but who would who, you pick uh, out of these people? Oh, uh, to, as an introduction to the Catholic faith as a writer in the last one hundred years. Uh, if I had if I had to pick one, I mean that is that's also hard. We've got a lot to go through. I have one that's now coming to the front of my mind, and I'm trying to think of others. Honestly, if you had to just pick one, I mean I still think people should get one of my books. I think they're helpful. Yes, but I mean the do. one who's the, the one who's the best. I would honestly pick the writings of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, like his book mm. Introduction to Christianity or a lot of his other works. I think he he is really one of the first popes who was also a legitimate uh, biblical theologian and scholar. And mm -hmm. so uh, I think a lot of his insights on the growth of Christianity and the growth of Catholicism, uh, I think he is someone great to, to start off with to understand uh, the Catholic faith from, from that perspective. That's great. That's great. Uh, so uh, listen, Trent, I really appreciate bringing you in here today because you're so knowledgeable. And I really, I mean, just since I've subscribed to your channel, I keep binging on all your videos. So <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just love them. And I love the book that you wrote, The Case for Catholicism. If you guys haven't picked that up, please go pick that up. It's right on Amazon and it's also on Trent's website. So I don't know if I put a link to your website, but I definitely will. I, oh, sure. I know I've put a link to your Catholic book. But there's other books, too. So did you want to tell everybody what you're working on now and what kind of projects you're thinking about and that kind of thing? 
so the next book I'm going to release is a book. I have a book called Devil's Advocate, which is a dialogue book with my inner skeptic. That's available now uh, for sale. Another book that I've uh, sent to the printer that's being edited now is When Protestants Argue Like Atheists. So like what we mentioned earlier about the Deutero canon, I have a whole book that surveys these similarities in hopes our Protestant brothers and sisters will abandon arguments that actually undermine Christianity itself. Oh, that's good. That's good. And so are you, do you have any upcoming debates? Um, none. The only one that's scheduled is for March 2nd with Gavin Ortland on Sola Scriptura. So I'm really looking forward to that. Oh, that's good. That's a while, while away, though. A while away, yeah. Nothing. Not, I have a lot on my plate now. I'm trying to get a lot of writing done, so I haven't scheduled a lot of debates. Maybe once that's all off the plate, then um, we'll do some more debates and dialogues. Good. Yeah. Well, you're a great representative for Catholicism. I think you're just a great representative for Christianity more broadly, but I really appreciate having you come on my channel and I hope you guys please go like and subscribe to this channel if you like this kind of content, but also please go over to his channel. So the Council of Trent, C-O-U-N-S-E-L of Trent, and make sure you do that. So any other parting shots, anything we didn't talk about today <laughs> that you think might be important? No, not today. Uh, I, I think we covered a lot of great ground, and I would definitely recommend for listeners, uh, if you would like an in-depth defense of Catholicism in regards to Protestant objections, my book, The Case for Catholicism, uh, would be good to check out. Yes. Yeah. You'll read it and you won't want to put it down. I, I went through it and it's just wonderful. And so then I see you have a number of other cases for Catholicism, other books on Catholicism too. Yes. So, well, great. Well, thank you, uh, Trent, so much for coming on my channel. You guys, please, please remember... Just remember, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all in the glory of God. Hey guys, thank you so much for checking this out. Be sure to go and check out SJ's channel as well. I'm going to link to it in the description below. Subscribe to her and to my channel as well. That's always a big help. Thank you guys so much, and I hope you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to TrentHornPodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.